about humanitarian principles and life-saving actions to ensure that people affected by crisis can live and survive with dignity. So while the sphere standards are universal, we need to contextualize the actions and the indicators depending on the situation or the country that we're in. And that's why we set up this session today to hear from different practitioners and trainers around the world how they are using sphere standards in their context. So I'm really delighted today that we're going to welcome six speakers from six different countries who are going to tell us about how they use sphere. Now we've got quite a tight timetable. So each speaker will present their experiences of SPEAR for 10 minutes, and then we'll have just five minutes um, of Q&A, and then I'm afraid we will have to go on to the next speaker. And then at um, 3.50, so in 45 minutes, we will have a 15 minute break, okay? And then after the break, our final three speakers. So um, let's get going because we're already one minute behind schedule. Um, so I would like to present our first speaker. So thank you, Nahoko Harada, for joining us from Japan. And you are going to talk to us today about contextualizing spear indicators for an online rapid assessment system. So thank you, Nahoko. I will leave the floor to you. Felicity, I view CD on my PowerPoint. Good, thank you. Oh, hello everyone. My name is Nehoko Harada from the Grad School of Interdisciplinary Science and Engineering in Health Systems at Okayama University here in Japan. I'm truly honored to be with the Sphere Evangelist from around the world. Today, um, I will introduce how the Sphere standards are being contextualized in Japan using two case studies. First, let me briefly introduce myself. Um, so I'm currently a university faculty member, but my profession ba professional background is nursing. While when I was studying at the grad school in the United States, the Great East Japan earthquake happened in 12, uh, 2011, and I had a unique experience of entering Japan from the United States to Japan as a disaster maker support worker 40 hours later. During that support, I strongly felt the importance of support based on the sphere standards and the, uh, became a trainer in 12, uh, 2013. Since then, I've been working as an advocate for support based on the principal sphere, targeting various levels of supporters such as government, academic institutions, and in uh, community responders in Japan. The two tools I will introduce today are the rapid assessment system for the shelters and the CHS commitment self-check tool. The first one is the uh, rapid assessment system for sh uh, shelters called D24H. The motivation for the creating this system came from a knowledge of the EMIS emergency medical system um, as a national disaster medical supporter called DMAT. EMIS is an information aggregation system for a damage status and a surge capacity of the medical institutions in the event of a disaster. It is owned by the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, and a DMAT personnel, government officials, and the public health center staff can access the data. Thanks to the system, uh, it is possible to manage the demand and the supply of medical care over a wide area. However, I had an issue with the fact that the system could not assess shelters. So as a visiting researcher at the National Institute of Public Health, 
a National Public Health Center Research Institution, I and my colleague from the engineering researcher created an online assessment tool that is easy to input even for the, those who are not tech savvy. The challenge at the time was selection of the assessment items. As you may have experienced, and the more you discuss what you want to hear, the more items increase, depending on your standing point. There are various perspectives such as public health, medical, administrative, and the welfare, and such. In addition, disaster support workers in Japan tend to try to conduct comprehensive assessments during the time when we are supposed to do in the rapid assessment. Therefore, when developing the rapid assessment tool, I really needed to set indicators that many stakeholders would agree on. The sphere standards indicate that provided strong support at the time. There are nine items, drinking water, meals, toilets, fuel, domestic water, overcrowding, bedding, temperature and humidity management, and hand washing environment. Each item is rated on the ABCD scale with A being the most desirable condition and the D being the least desirable condition. For example, for drinking water, A means there's a more than three liters of drinking water per person per day besides, for, uh, besides uh, the meals. B means there's a more than two liters drinking water as such, and C means there's a more than one liter of drinking water. But D means there's about one liter of water intake per person per day, including meals. In contextualizing these indicators, I refer to WASH standards 2.1, access and water quantity, and the appendix three. Let me introduce the Japanese context here. Jap Japanese people use an average of 220 liters of water per day. So I believe the indicate may be set higher compared to the countries with a fewer water resources. So for the temperature control in shelters, the indicator is set as shown in the current slide. This is based on the context of the many of the shelters designated by the local governments in Japan are often equipped with the air conditioning system and electricity, electricity is also stably supplied during the normal times. Japan is located in the monsoon climate zone with hot summers and cold winters. Statistically speaking, more than 60,000 people are transported to, uh, by ambulance because of the heat stroke in, during the summer each year, and more than um, 1,000 people die. So uh, uh, furthermore, the person aged 65 and over account for about 90% of the total number of the heat, heat stroke death. Japan is known as a super aged society, as you know, with a proportion of people aged 65 and over accounting for about 30% of total population. These figures can show how much the shelter environment can have a significant impact on the vulnerable population. Japan experienced a relatively large disaster called the Noto Peninsula earthquake during the New Year holidays. At the time, D24H was used, and the Ishikawa Prefecture Government, which was a disaster response headquarters, located 130 kilometers away from Suzu City at the tip of the peninsula, was able to grasp the environment of the shelters, so headquarters could respond quickly. The information entered the front liners using the app is visualized in this way. Of course, not everything went, uh, went smoothly. Uh, in the early stage of the response, there was a time when the internet connection was unstable 
and the data was uh, that liner had struck to enter was not stored in the server. So their effort was in vain. Nevertheless, I believe that this, this system has contributed to making support for shelters, which involves many more stakeholders than, than the uh, disaster medical field, more prompt and effective. So the second uh, tool is the uh, CHS self-assistant app. This app was created with my colleagues while we are working as a sphere trainer here in Japan. CH is a very useful tool for evaluating the quality of our activities and continuous improvement efforts. But some participants find it difficult to read through the nine commitments. Also, Japanese people are very um, impatient in some extent and they demand that we trainer and understand everything in the sphere handbook in just two days. Even under these conditions, we considered how we could effectively help participants understand the importance of the CHS by linking their valuable ex experiences to this training. Participants were asked to respond to this self-assessment app before the training. By looking at each result, we trainer and can identify the items that should be focused on that, that training. What we have learned from our training so far is that experienced supporters conceptually understand each commitment, commitment of the CHS and observationally apply it to their support, but they do not use it with the specificity just described in the handbook. So this app encourages understanding that the, that the contents of the handbook are linked to specific actions by answering each question one by one. As a result of the response, the strengths and the challenges of the one support are automatically visualized and the issue that needed to be addressed as a supporter based on CHS become clear. Our training style like many sphere trainer repeats participatory workshops. So we use a lot of the sticky notes, but by developing this app, we may have become a little more environmentally, uh, environmentally friendly. So um, this is my last slide. And then the, uh, the two tools I introduced today are cases that attempt contextualizing from two aspects. The context in which Japan frequently experiences natural disasters, but conducts most of its emergency response within the country due to its high response capacity and the context based on Japanese culture and custom. I would be honored to receive feedback and the impressions from you. Thank you for your attention. And here is the, uh, the link, uh, the QR code, uh, QR code uh, linking to the uh, website we are running. Thank you so much. Oh, you are on. Uh, yeah, thank, 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 thank you so much, Nahoko, for that fascinating uh, presentation about how you've really contextualized Sphere um, to the Japanese context. Um, as we are short on time, I'm going to ask anyone who has questions um, or would like further information from Nahoko um, to do that in the chat. So, Nahoko, if you can just keep an eye on the chat and answer any questions. Um, and if you don't mind, we'll go straight on to our next speaker. This is a whistle-stop tour of the world today, I'm afraid. So I would like to welcome now uh, Borja Santos. Um, Borja is a spear trainer and associate vice dean at IE University in Spain. And he's going to talk to us about a multimedia case study that he has been developing as a teaching tool. Um, thank you, Borja. Over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Felicity. Um, um, uh, good afternoon, good morning. I'm based in Spain, uh, although currently 
I'm in, in America for work. And what I'm going to present, um, during the last five years, I've been working as vice dean of a university called IE, in particular, the School of Politics, Economics, and Global Affairs. Uh, and I teach one course on how to manage humanitarian crisis responses. Therefore, one of the modules is to teach um, humanitarian standards, and I teach to students um, uh, what the sphere standards. So I'm going to try to explain how we have been teaching sphere through a particular case study. Before that, I worked for 15 years, uh, mainly in United Nations, in the World Food Program and UNDP, helping governments to improve preparedness actions for future emergencies. Uh, especially, I developed several methodologies on, uh, on building contingency plans. And therefore, also, I have a lot of experience uh, while preparing, teaching, and training uh, civil officers and public servants from different governments on sphere standards. Uh, so how do I teach this in the university? This is what I'm, what I'm gonna present. Well, first of all, obviously we were teaching humanitarian affairs uh, and usually in a class, like many of you probably are trainers or you teach in a university. So you teach humanitarian principles, the role of different actors in a humanitarian response. You teach uh, humanitarian international, you know, international humanitarian law and, and what are the main aspects of protection and the negotiation of the humanitarian access. And of course, you teach, uh, we need to teach, and this is what I'm doing as well, uh, how to provide and how to develop a humanitarian needs assessment, right? And this is where we introduce a sphere, like how do you use the sphere guidelines to uh, prepare a better humanitarian needs assessment? So. I mean, at the beginning, when we were started teaching that, we were basically teaching the main aspect of the sphere, showing a video, and then asking the students to uh, take the book and take the guideline, right? <clears throat> and based on some cases, looking for some pages. So students were reviewing the pages, looking for some information, and therefore providing a response. So we were saying, imagine you are in an emergency where there are floods, and you need to provide a response for shelter and you have these particular conditions, uh, tell me uh, how many square meters, what are the different I don't know, um, uh, requirements that the shelter should have, and you can look at it in page uh, 235 to 240, right? And basically students were reading that and providing that information. But we realized this was not really working. I don't know, like people were reading it and basically, but I don't know, they were not really understanding um, what is the point, right? Um, so therefore, what we start doing is creating a, a case study, basically a, a, a situation that happened in reality. Um, and based on that situation, we were developing uh, different actions to teach sphere guidelines, right? I We develop a case study, uh, I post it in the chat, and now we are working a multimedia case with this. What do I mean by that? Well, let me explain you briefly. Uh, um, there was in 2019, there was an emergency in Ethiopia with uh, more than 1 million people displaced in between two regions, Oromia and the southern nations, in two municipalities, two Boredas called Guji and Gedeo. It was a tribal fight because of natural resources, but it was huge because 1 million people were displaced to host communities around this area. So basically, we divide the students in four different roles the government uh, in charge of providing, of course, the first humanitarian response uh, to protect and to establish peace right in these uh, tribal fights and also to protect the rights of the host community because many of the resources of the host community were somehow there was a high consumption of natural resources all the public services were stopped etc then you have the ngo who should really take care about the needs of the local population they are very close then you have the role of the un who is in charge of well negotiating humanitarian principles and establish as well a shared the, the standards, and then you have the own community who is requesting their needs. So we divide the response in, in two moments. Uh, the, I mean, the sorry, the teaching exercise, we divide it in two moments. One, start before coming to the class, and we are building right now that, and basically is a multimedia case. So students, they need to enter into the case and answer some questions before coming to the class and participating in a negotiation between these four actors. 
And what do I do? Instead of asking the students, uh, the first part is instead of asking the students, hey, go to the page, blah, 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 and look about these requirements, we teach them a sphere and they, they need to read some important information that actually we take into account all the resources that the sphere provides institutionally in their website and all the toolkits that are fantastic. But what we try to do is break means conception. So instead of letting them know, good, go to the P to that page and reading it, we prepare a several multiple choice tests. And without any initial knowledge, we ask the students how to provide a good humanitarian response and how to establish needs assessment without any knowledge. Therefore, I mean, people have a lot of prejudices and a lot of preconceptions, right? And in terms of pedagogy, one student memorize and understand better things when you break misconceptions. So rather than uh, showing the students like read this and tell me what you have read and tell me something, basically what we try to do is try to find a lot of misconceptions, prejudices about shelter, what's and health, about all the different priorities, right? So students, they need to answer these multiple choice questions in many cases fail, but when they fail, you give them an answer why that answer is fail, and they need to try it again until the test is done 100%. But the idea here is that students fail a lot of times, and you have an explanation why that answer is wrong, right? So the main point, I think, to teach students as well and, and bring a sphere the value is that uh, you need to be a very good professional and very well trained on the humanitarian standards before providing a humanitarian response, right? And try to break all these misconceptions that there are many. So this is the first step we do. Once the students have realized that and they, they change somehow the mindset and say, wow, incredible, I, I have these thoughts initially, but now it's true that, well, you need to be better prepared. And I understand the use of the standards, the, the use of the indicators and the use of the guidelines to contextualize those indicators, because we explain that when we answer them, when they were wrong in their initial answers. The second step is to provide, um, well, a, a, a needs assessment, right? Before coming to the meeting, before coming to the class. Uh, in Ecuador, when I was working in Ecuador, uh, we developed um, uh, contingency planning guidelines. Uh, it's a, I forgot to, to, to copy it, but I, I'll paste it later. And basically, we help the, um, the Ecuadorian government kind of like to prepare a humanitarian calculator. So basically, we build an Excel, an Excel sheet with a lot of different tabs based on the sectors. We provide a lot of orientations based on the Ecuadorian context. If you were in the Indian area, if you were in the coastal area, if you were in the in the rainforest, and based on those contextualizations, it was a, a it was a humanitarian calculator. They were the government were establishing their numbers, their needs, and immediately the calculator was giving a response on the number of resources that municipality should prepare in advance anything would happen, right? So basically we were asking the municipalities to establish precedent figures, what has happened recently in the past. So basically most probably something similar could happen. So all those resources to attend the humanitarian, the population, they should be already uh, pre-established, right? So we are doing something similar. In this case, we are trying, we are testing, we, are, uh, we have developed a chatbot and we are testing how it works for the students to interact with the chatbot. So the idea is the chatbot, you don't say, okay, I have an emergency, 10,000 people, uh, how many liters of water we need? No, it doesn't work like that. Once the chatbot is asking you for a lot of information. So basically the idea of the student who is providing information is that the chatbot is making questions to the students, okay, what is the number of population? But then let's disaggregate the population, age, gender, uh, potential disabilities, and then tell me about the context, and then tell me about the time, then tell me about many different aspects, right? So the potential, um, for me, the potential um, value of the chatbot that we are generating, and let's see how it works, because we know that the still chatbot has a lot of biases and it's not perfect, is asking the students a lot of questions, right? to really understand that you need to take a lot of things into account, that the indicators need to be contextualized. So it's not something fixed, right? And you need to basically bring the humanitarian standards of a sphere and contextualize them to a place and asking you a lot of questions. And this is what you need to be prepared. 
if you are not prepared in advance to ask to answer those questions, you arrive to an emergency and you have highly chance high chances of of making mistakes, right? The same thing with the type of food, uh, amount qual amount of water, quality of the shelters, etc. So right now, the second part is that this chatbot is interacting with the students. And finally, and with this I finalize, students will arrive to class, first of all, with a lot of uh, preconceptions broken. Second, understanding that the context is very important. And then they arrive to class and we put together the four actors. They play a role game, a role play, sorry. And they interact to each other, asking for, well, negotiating the humanitarian access, but knowing the sphere guidelines much better and being able to negotiate better the humanitarian actors and use the proper vocabulary, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what we are building right now. And well, and thank you very much. Felicity, I'm open for questions, of course. Uh, well, thank you, Borja. Uh, there, there was there was a, a lot there, um, but I'm sure that everyone is extremely interested uh, in what you're doing in your university in terms of this active learning approach, the challenging um, or breaking people's misconceptions, um, but also the use of AI, uh, which is a massive topic um, for everyone at the moment. So again, I think, um, well, we probably do have time for a question, um, actually, before we go on to our next speaker. So would anybody like to put up their hand um, and ask Borja a question, whether you have a question about the AI chatbot or the humanitarian calculator? Um, any questions from anyone? Phil, as uh, I'm going to pick on Phil, um, as a fellow university uh, professor, um, do you have any comments or thoughts? Or I know you do similar things in the University of Portsmouth. Are you there? Hi, Willis. Um, yes, thank you. It's interesting listening. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear yes. you. Can you hear me? Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Um, oh, it's interesting to listen to uh, Borges and, and the way he was um, consolidating the learning that has been given. Um, I don't want to give too much away because I have a room full of students at the moment who are going to have some learning consolidated in the next module of their course. But um, we apply a similar situation here in that we we give them some um, some of Sphere's excellent online learning as a kind of precursor to any input they get and then we um, attend sessions like this or sometimes in previous years we've had sphere trainers or even Felicity herself come on to the, to the university to give them some more, more information and then part of the master's course that they do is to uh, undertake uh, some scenario based training which tests the knowledge of some of the sphere standards not to a huge degree because it's only one small part of the, the course that we run but um, it's certainly you can see where they've taken on board some of that knowledge and where it's it's um, easier for them to then apply that knowledge practically in, in scenario based sessions where where they're needing to use some of those standards and some of that information especially from the sphere handbook so interesting that we're, we're following a similar uh, structure in the way that we're, we're teaching that's nice to see in some respects thank you Borja. thank you phil Okay, um, thank you. And if anyone has any more questions um, for Borgia or for Phil um, about um, sphere teaching in universities, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat. Um, and also, okay. as some of you know, sphere is uh, undertaking a research project at the moment uh, with the Graduate Institute in Geneva. And we have a group of students looking at exactly this question, um, which is how can we um, improve uh, the quality of humanitarian standards in teaching in universities. And one of the key answers that we're already getting back um, is to have more uh, real life situations, more scenarios, more active learning, and less uh, go to page 25 um, and recite what you've read. So thank you very much, Borja. Um, moving on, um, we will now move on to our third speaker before the break. Um, so I would like to welcome Raju Thapa, um, who is joining us from Nepal. Uh, 
Uh, Raju is chair of DPNet, which is Sphere's focal point in Nepal. And he's going to talk to us about using Sphere standards during the 2023 um, West Nepal earthquake. So over to you, Raja. Thank you. Raju, thank you. Uh, thank you, Felicity. Uh, good day to everyone listening from different parts of the world. It is uh, remarkable how disaster like COVID-19 can sometimes lead to unexpected opportunity. For instance, uh, this pandemic has familiarized us with online platform, allowing us to organize meeting like this uh, one without have to resource expenditure. Uh, first and foremost, I express my heartfelt gratitude, gratitude for the chance to share Nepal recent experience with the earthquake in Western Nepal and discuss the implications regarding humanitarian standards. Uh, Nepal vulnerability to seismic activities is well known due to its frequent and devastating earthquake. Uh, uh, let me tell you some statistics. Over the past 52 years, Nepal has got 843 earthquake, including earthquake of magnitude uh, 6 to 7 is 11, and with two significant Earthquake measuring uh, between seven to eight tractor scale. Uh, the western part of Nepal, in particular, faces of heightened seismic risks and evident from a seismic gap spanning 500 years, hinting at a potential large scale uh, earthquake uh, in the future. Recent earthquake event of 6.4 magnitude in the western part of Nepal, uh, 2023, uh, claimed uh, 154 uh, lives. <clears throat> Let me tell you about uh, the 2015 Gorkha earthquake, uh, a major catastrophe uh, measuring 7.8 magnitude that is struck uh, uh, to lead almost 9,000 dead and over, over, over 22,000 injury. It caused extensive damage uh, to almost 500,000 500, private homes and 753 uh, educational buildings. Fortunately, it occurs during the holiday, like uh, uh, likely mitigate casualties as uh, 19,500 classrooms were totally destroyed, which could have been catastrophic had schools uh, been in session. So following the 2023 earthquake, uh, which damaged uh, 75,000 houses uh, in disaster affected area, uh, significant reconstruction report are necessary. Given the remote uh, location and disaster area in the hills of Nepal, addressing rescue and relief challenges during the initial days uh, uh, proved challenging. Uh, however, uh, I represent DeepNet, and DeepNet swiftly organized a stakeholder discussion and provided updates on field condition to humanitarian partners. DeepNet mobilized teams to collect first hand information and publish daily analytical situation reports and outlining gaps in areas for intervention. These reports were highly regarded by both government and non-governmental stakeholders, guiding their planning and activities based on DeepNet's daily situation analysis report. Uh, let me tell you how we prepare in advance. DeepNet's uh, coordination led to the inclusion of humanitarian standard training system by the Ministry of Federal Affairs and the other training for all 753 local governments of Nepal before this earthquake. DeepNet employed innovative methods like street drama, folk song, and storytelling to educate community about the humanitarian standards. So the community of all 753 local governments, they are so far you know, familiar with uh, uh, these uh, innovative uh, humanitarian standards because of this uh, innovative <clears throat> way of teaching. They, uh, and, uh, uh, DeepNet also disseminated hard copies of Sphere Handbook to all local governments, all 753 local government, ensuring awareness among local authority and humanitarian partners. <clears throat> because of this effort, <clears throat> no significant problems related to minimum inventory standard were reported in the western part of uh, uh, Nepal in recent earthquake. While some beneficiaries they complain about the standard relief uh, related food items. These issues were promptly addressed because you know DeepNet raised this concern uh, through its daily situation report. <clears throat> Another thing is like you know uh, the grievances regarding limited space in makeshift shelters were resolved uh, considering the family size. 
uh, with the widespread awareness of sphere standard among local governments and humanitarian, stand, humanitarian partners. Similar disaster events are uh, less likely to encounter significant issues of humanitarian standard in the future because we reach all the local governments of Nepal and we sensitize them. <clears throat> I think uh, <clears throat> it is uh, important for each country to have a watchdog organization like uh, DPNET to monitor field problems and regularly publish a report to inform stakeholders about the humanitarian standard. Nepali humanitarian workers appreciate how DPNET's uh, regular situation reports guided stakeholders through the overall process, including adopting minimum humanitarian standard. We have learned that community attention uh, to humanitarian standard is best uh, drawn through innovative approaches like street drama, folk song, storytelling. Uh, like uh, uh, if you go to the community with 500 pages is long, then that doesn't make sense. So sensitizing local governments and humanitarian partners about this standard before disaster occur can prevent chaotic situation. Uh, even during disaster, widely accepted uh, watchdog organizations like DeepNet can produce independent reports to guide stakeholders effectively. <clears throat> Lastly, uh, I would like to uh, uh, tell you one thing, innovative met methods, uh, which can have better uh, prepare for response for future disaster event while upholding essential humanitarian standards. So, <clears throat> we need to tailor uh, the humanitarian standard in our context and we need to grab the attention to uh, engage the community people. Thank you so much, Felicity. Uh, um, thank, thank you very much, Raju, for sharing your experience. Um, and it's, it's encouraging to hear um, that the preparedness work that you did beforehand um, in distributing handbooks, in training local government um, actors, but also in terms of the local population with, with your street theatre programme, um, that all that um, helped uh, to be prepared um, for, for when the earthquake came. Um, so thank you, Raja. Um, Raju, I wonder, does anybody have any questions for Raju? Um, if so, please do put your hands up. I don't know if we have anybody else here from Nepal. I'm just looking at some of the names to see who we know. Um, are there any questions in the chat, in the chat, Tristan or Roma, that we should be aware of? Oh. Tristan's shaking his head, no. Okay, well, in that case, I suggest that we go to our break. Um, so we will now have a 15 minute break. So we will meet back at uh, four o'clock uh, Geneva time, um, but we're going to post into the chat um, the link uh, to a YouTube video um, that was recorded by a spear trainer in Burkina Faso. Uh, she couldn't join us today, but she very kindly recorded a 10 minute video uh, talking about uh, capacity building in terms of sphere um, in Burkina Faso um, since 2020. Um, so please do, while you're making your cup of tea or, or having your cake, because that's what we do, the Brits, at four o'clock, um, please um, watch um, Caddy's video um, about Burkina Faso, and then we will all meet back here, please, um, at four o'clock, where we will listen to our next um, three speakers, um, who are going to be talking to us about Turkey, Indonesia, and Venezuela. So see you all at, at four o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Roma, are you there? Roma, there we are. Okay, Roma is uh, taking over from Tristan um, in the chat, so answering any questions and, and helping out. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, uh, for rejoining us after our 15 minute break. Um, I hope some of you managed to watch uh, the video that Caddy uh, sent us from Burkina Faso. I can see Hassan. Um, and Hassan uh, was trained with Caddy, I believe, or by Caddy. Uh, sorry? Were you were you trained with Caddy in Burkina Faso? 
Yes, our student with uh, her here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, it's great to see from the video the momentum from that training of trainers uh, that took place, I believe, in 2020. Um, and now you're organizing trainings um, in government ministries, um, taking part in national professional training programs, um, yeah. as well as offering open training courses um, that you know people from all sorts of different organizations can join. Yes. Um, and I love the idea of T-shirts um, for people who've been trained. Mm -hmm. Please send us a photo of a Sphere T-shirt. Okay. I don't okay. think I've ever seen that. Um, yes. And and brilliant that you're creating WhatsApp groups yes. um, so that once the training's finished, people can continue to communicate. Um, yes. And as they try to put the learning into practice, they can ask each other for questions and for support. Um, yes. So you know, we thank Kelly. She wasn't able to join us, but we thank her for, for sending her video. Okay, and thank you, Hassan, for being here. Right, you're let's welcome. move on. Um, so we're going to go to the second half of our, our session now, and I would like to welcome Ida Nagura from Plan International uh, in Indonesia, and Ida is going to talk to us about community engagement and accountability and how that fits in with the SPHERE standards. So over to you, Ida. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you, Felicity. Uh, thank you, uh, Spear, uh, for having me here. Uh, I will, um, while I while I start to share screen, uh, um, uh, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Ida Mura. Uh, I work with a Plan International based in Indonesia. Um, I hope my voice uh, all right with you all. Um, uh, if it is all right with you, my voice, I will. Okay, so uh, so I would like to present on the uh, on the how how we use uh, Spear Handbook uh, in in reviewing our response, particularly in community engagement accountability practice in hygiene promotion standard. Uh, I will start uh, with the information on the response itself. We have a six month res uh, response back in twenty twenty one for the first flood uh, in Lembata uh, in entity province uh, in Indonesia. So the flash flood uh, itself um, uh, impacted to district in Lembata and uh, causes uh, cause several people died, missing, injured, and also um, uh, thousands being evacuated, and also there are uh, hundreds of uh, houses uh, damaged. Based on the rapid need assessment and also uh, gender assessment, we uh, develop our intervention, particularly in was sector. Um, such as uh, install hand washing station, including uh, distribution hygiene kit and menstrual hygiene kit, and also um, conducting promotion of hygiene practices and also uh, prevention of COVID-19. Uh, when we have uh, when we have uh, this response, the number of cases of COVID-19 uh, was increased in Lembata. Uh, we have uh, we have used a uh, spare uh, handbook to guide us to develop the key guiding question for us to review internally on our response, uh, particularly in uh, hygiene promotion standard. As you can see, uh, we highlighted um, uh, uh, the important information on on the spare standard uh, to to help us to develop a guiding questions. I will not. Uh, uh, I will not uh, uh, read uh, by one by one. But uh, this is that uh, we uh, develop uh, on the review matrix for uh, community engagement and vulnerability um, using the matrix perspective of project cycles management. Uh, on the on the on the left column, you can see the three pillars, community engagement accountability that we uh, used and we consider. The first one is two-way information and communication. And the second one is about community engagement and also, um, sorry, and, the, uh, and then the third one is about um, 
uh, feedback mechanism. So I will not uh, read uh, one by one these key guiding questions, but as you can see, the the word that uh, I we, we bold here, for example, like in the first pillar to is information and communication in the uh, cycles of assessment and analysis, we we ask the guide, key guiding question, do you identify the essential uh, hygiene items that needs and also uh, in the program design and planning, do you consult women and girls and people in continent and also uh, in the implementation, uh, do you work with affected people and how do you develop communication strategy and for the uh, monitoring, evaluation, accountability and learning, we ask the key guiding question on the uh, do you identify and train influential individual and also do you work with uh, uh, children and young people. So there's uh, another also key guiding question on the second and the third pillar so i will uh, move to the move to the result uh, as you can see also we have this uh, matrix uh, similar with the key guiding question this is the result that we found uh, during our internal review involve uh, our emergency response team in Lambata and also uh, volunteers there uh, the first uh, the first pillar on the um, on the two ways information and communication uh, in the uh, cycles of assessment and analysis we found that um, we have a rapid need assessment that uh, identified essential needs and also we found uh, uh, what is the inter in, uh, 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 intersectionality of the affected people that we consider and also for the program design and planning, the consultation uh, by FGD with different groups to seek the specific needs on hygiene and uh, sanitation facilities. Uh, and then uh, for the implementation, Indonesia work with the paid uh, community volunteers and help others to formulate the key message on hygiene practices. We also uh, using different uh, kind of channels to communicate. Uh, using the loudspeaker in most of churches because it's most of uh, affected people in the villages and then we use also a poster a video during the during the people living in the evacuation uh, camp they can see the the, uh, the the video and then the community meeting and we also use the different uh, five different local languages there uh, for the meal uh, cycles, uh, we work with the local um, train local uh, youth uh, groups and community leaders to 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 help us in the assessment and also delivering the key messages. And uh, for the second pillar of the SIA practices, community engagement uh, in the assessment and analysis involve uh, traditional groups to identify social norms and myths on the hygiene practices such as like um, menstrual taboo and for the program design and planning we uh, design the distribution and hygiene kit uh, with the with the local uh, authority leaders and COVID-19 tax force and also the local was cluster and CVA working group because we use also the modality CVA to reach out the most needed uh, uh, affected people and for the implementation we distribute uh, the hygiene and menstrual kit uh, supported by the local uh, local youth group and also COVID-19 uh, tax force directly to the participant while the um, case-based assistant uh, we work with the local suppliers and for the meals monitoring we, we, we supported we got support by the health cutters and sanitarian that they use their assessment tools to help monitor uh, condition and uh, condition sanitation facilities and hygiene practices of people in evacuation camp and the feedback mechanism uh, pillar uh, from, from the assessment and analysis, uh, we found that the factors that motivate, uh, motivate affected people on positive behavior and preventive action is the is the appreciation on their needs and dignity. And uh, we develop inclusive um, feedback channels since beginning of the project uh, in design and planning. And also uh, the feedback uh, during the implementation, we gather feedback through written verbal drawing for the children. And also we conduct a post-distribution uh, post monitoring to see the satisfaction level. And for the meals, Plan Indonesia using the feedback dashboard that we develop in, in Excel to monitor uh, uh, feedback from uh, since beginning uh, receive process uh, response and also the closing. 
uh, this is only for the uh, hygiene uh, promotion standard. Uh, we cannot uh, cannot uh, display you or uh, present you uh, the other standard of the matter of the time, but we will um, develop kind of a case study and then uh, hopefully it will be uh, shared publicly, uh, uh, publicly uh, later on. And the uh, key learning that we take that SPEAR provide us a uh, clear guidance uh, uh, for the humanitarian uh, actor like Plan Indonesia to develop an appropriate and relevant response uh, from the whole cycles of the project management and respectful, dignified was uh, response for the affected people can be obtained uh, by the listening to the different group of children, engage community engagement, engaging local leaders and group, and also responding to the feedback on the right side, you can see one of the uh, feedback channels that you, that uh, we uh, use in Lembata back then. Uh, I think that's all from me, Felici. Thank you. Oh, um, thank you so much, Ida. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, and it was just brilliant to see how you translated the the guidelines into concrete actions um so th thank you very much and i would i would love to you mentioned um that you might produce case studies of other um standards so if you do that uh we would love you to to share them with us because i'm sure everyone would be really interested um and i have to say i particularly liked your feedback mechanism for children uh, when they could draw pictures um, of of how they were feeling. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, does anyone have any questions for Ida? Oh, I, that... I want to like uh, which was the main challenge that in the implementation of WASH and in the experience of Ida in the case that she explained to us. Okay, did you get that question, Ida? What what were the main challenges in the implementation of WASH in that situation? Because the response is implemented during the COVID-19 uh, spike in Lembata in 2021, it's really difficult to, prov uh, to, uh, to, to provide the intervention, any kind of intervention, especially for affected people who are living in ev uh, ev evacuation uh, camps because they are prone to in infected by the COVID. And also the paid volunteers and community uh, community um, uh, cadres, health cadres that, that also supported us in, in, in the response and also our own staff that also um, uh, are prone to uh, infected by the COVID back then. So um, we cannot, uh, the, 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 the challenges that we, we face during the uh, worst response is that we cannot, uh, you cannot do anything, do, we cannot do all. Uh, there is a, you know, there is a, a certain activity that we cannot uh, afford to do, for example, like maybe the water supply because we do not have a water uh, resource available in Lamata. Uh, we have to uh, we have to take uh, from the other um, villages or far away from the from the evacuation center, and we cannot do the man uh, waste management uh, com uh, in com comprehensively to make sure that uh, our response is not uh, harmful to environmental uh, and etc. So I think there's a you no know, there is a part of the collaboration and also a coordination that we have to do during the response. So we cannot uh, one single organization cannot do everything uh, by by themselves you still mute yeah Felicity. thank you Ida. um does anyone else have oh there's a thumbs up from vanda yeah oh, that was thank you vanda do you have any comments vanda would you like to say anything were you involved in this response Hello. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, thank Amanda. you, thank you so, thank you so much, Felicity. And then, yeah, I will give uh, thumbs up because uh, Ngura is one of the champion uh, in 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 plan international in really promoting the sphere standard. Um, and also because you know Indonesia can able to do uh, what Ngura presenting because they invest a lot in their emergency response team, where they always include sphere um uh, and the other humanitarian standard. Uh, in the session for the uh, the staff, and so the emergency response team member is able to be exposed to the knowledge, uh, and then they will also increase their their skill. 
and some of it hopefully will be appear into the sphere report this year uh, we share uh, some information to uh, to tristan as well so there will be uh, some in that and um i think the other thing is also um the commitment uh, from the uh, the country management team the uh, um the, the the people uh, in in plan international especially in indonesia who also uh, promoting this and final Point, uh, plan Indonesia also active in the network, uh, uh, in the cluster, uh, as well as in the working uh, group. And Mura and Indonesia team was uh, chairing basically the, the national working group on community engagement and accountability, where Sphere is always being promoted. So collaboration with other organizations become important. So yeah, thank you also for the opportunity. And Mura, well done. Over back to you, Felicity. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see how we're on time. Does anybody have any other questions or comments for Ida before we move on? Just checking. Okay, no other hands up. So we'll move on. Thank you very much, Ida. And we look forward to hearing more uh, as, as we go forward. Okay, so let's move on to our next speaker. I would like to welcome Miguel Morales. Um, who is originally from Bolivia, but living in Venezuela and is a sphere trainer. And he's going to talk about talk to us about coordination and planning during response to flooding in 2010 in Miranda State in Venezuela. Over to you, Miguel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen. Okay, um, as um, Felicity told us, um, I'm from Venezuela, but I'm living in Bolivia uh, since uh, 2016. I'm a geological engineer, um, former director of the Risk Management Office in Civil Protection of Miranda State in Venezuela, um, former municipal and community manager um, of the DIPECO um, nine uh, with Caritas de Venezuela with the aid of the European uh, Union. Um, the situation that I want to share with all of you is the floods in Miranda State in 2010. I'm main, making focus in the role of interagency coordination and field deployment planning. I want to explain uh, quickly the main features of the event in the period of November and December in um, 2010, torrential, torrential rain affect a wet area in Venezuela, specifically in Miranda State, at is a state in the coast region of my country. So heavy rains caused several landslides and debris flow in mountain area and extend flows in Barlovento Plains, that is the lower part of the state. All that strain conditions were attributed to the La Nina climatic uh, phenomenon. You can see in the, in the image in the, uh, in the lower left, that in that period, a um, lot of disturb and climatic disturbance happens in the north part of uh, South America and in Central America. And you also can see the magnitude of the event and the consequence in the pictures that shown in the slides. You can see uh, this area is in Iguerote, it's a main city in Barlovento. Um, not only uh, floods, um, also that uh, lifelines were affected, like uh, highways, um, hospitals. Um, many many roads um we we do um, we do need to deal with many collapses in the mountain area too but uh all all that situation that i described we can we can notice that uh, the times event may uh, prove any organization capacities um but all the climatic uh, situation um, provokes uh, a lot of consequence. 
um, that we can um, um, summarize like a lack of coordination between government agencies. And I list in this slide many of stats. Uh, inaccuracy in the number of people affected that uh, caused the multiplication of number of affected people due to the inefficient crossing and data filtering. And that happens because the political and media pressure to the authorities to accelerate the collection and processing of data about the magnitude of uh, the effect, the, the affection. Um, Non-proportionate distribution of humanitarian aid due to the um, impressive number of affected people. And that's happened a lot. Um, many families receive uh, from different organizations the same items. Um, by that, we 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 uh, exhaust uh, or or um, resources. Um, also, the duplication of effort to cover areas already assisted by other organizations and delays to assist more isolated areas. Um, maybe that is one of the most um, hard uh, consequence because uh, in my case, in the civil protection of Miranda State, we, um, we take information and we make inspections in places that other uh, organizations like a municipal civil protection attends before. Um, by that, uh, we um, experience a lot of delays to assist other other regions. Um, um, other situation that for me was the most uh, uh, hard for the workers was the uh, the, uh, the prolonged exposure of the all of humanitarian workers in free, in, in field deployment during the in the, the crisis um, because in that situation many of them were affected too. Um, because they need to uh, work in the in, in the attention of the disaster, they cannot uh, help directly their families. Um, I think that that kind of of, of complication is very common in, in in wild disasters. But um, in that moment, we didn't know about this fair and the, all the information that, that standards um, um, contains. But after that, when we do uh, uh, a self-evaluation of our response and using the spheres, we find a lot of utile information like uh, I show in the slide. For example, uh, SPHERE says that SPHERE standards therefore also serve to improve coordination across organization and sector. Uh, coordination mechanisms such as the cluster system are required to establish a clear division of labor and responsibility and to identify gaps in coverage and quality. And that happened um, in the response of the Miranda State floods in 2010. It is important to prevent the duplication of the force and the waste of resources. That happened too. The sharing of information and knowledge between the stakeholders along with joint planning and integrated activities can also ensure that organizations manage this better and improve the outcome of a response. Uh, in other section um, about the commitments in the commitment six. Spare remarks on the relevance of coordination and the mechanisms to reach it, with four performance indicators that I suggest that all organizations need to, to use. That indicator are an organization minimize gaps and overlies identified by affected communities and partners for coordinated action. Responding organizations, including local organizations, share relevant informa information called formal and informa informal coordination mechanisms. Organizations coordinate needs assessment, delivery of humanitarian aid and monitoring of aid implementation. And finally, local organizations report adequate participation and representation in coordination mechanisms. Um, lastly, um, in the Agnex one, there is a recommendation to the governments of disaster affected countries 
that they um, have the responsibility of the overall planning and coordination of relief effort from the host government in support of the action of the other organization. As a reflection, I can say that um, maybe was the, the absence of the uh, leadership of the national government, or specifically of the national civil protection to coordinate of, to the uh, regional and the local um, institutions and all of the resources. And that's maybe one of the main gaps that we need to to confront. Um, for um, before to to finish, I want to share some aspects that, in my consideration, uh, we need to uh, implement and take in consideration to get adequate coordination. First, a good communications and defined communication channels. Uh, we need to uh, make auto recognition of all witness like organizations and um, standing working with other agencies before the crisis and uh, for that uh, the evacuation drills um the simulation exercises are very important we need to keep the focus on the on humanitarian imperative is um the the attention of disaster is not a competition between agencies and this is very important to to take in mind to keep in mind uh, about it. Uh, work with accountability, transparency, humility, and professionalism. Sometimes not only the, the workers from um, uh, national organizations, and sometimes also the NGO workers uh, maybe forget uh, all these aspects. Um, for, and finally, uh, we can get advantage of EIS technology to delimit uh, affected areas and resources deployed, um, information as dates, organizations, reports in, in, on, in only one system, incorporating a representative of each level of government in the analysis and making decision process. Um, all that aspect that uh, I share for me uh, were, um, were uh, are weak points in all response in that situation. Um, it's, it's all for me, so thank you for your attention. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you very much, Miguel, uh, for that really honest uh, analysis, uh, especially interesting since we had just heard from Vanda and Ida on the importance of coordination, um, and then to hear from you uh, what happens when there is a, a lack of coordination. So that was really interesting. Um, thank you very much. Um, does anybody have any questions for Miguel um, regarding that? Um, perhaps people are wondering, like me, uh, whether the coordination has improved. Um, since 2010 or whether you feel there are still the same challenges in some cases in some cases the situation in venezuela uh improved uh, about the coordination uh especially especially uh, with uh, ngos um but um there is uh political issues that um, um complicate all the situation for coordination because in some cases, uh, the national government uh, don't recognize or don't support the regional governments. Um, it's like a, a, they they made a, 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 a prohibition to 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 keep contact. So, is my country um, don't suffer uh, a disaster? Maybe like a, the happened with the Turkey uh, earthquake or, or some disaster um, in the time, in the recent time, but we are suffering other kind of situation because a uh, humanitarian crisis that made that lots of Venezuelan uh, spread um, in all the South America. Um, it's difficult, but it's important to highlight 
all the the aspect that I share with you because uh, this institution need to work and is in the case of a disaster happens they need to deal with all that problems so I think that maybe the expert not only guide us with the people that work in, 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 the, in, in the crisis attention but also help us to make that auto recognition to identify how we can improve or, or overall in, in that situation. So mm -hmm. for that, I want to um, make a recognition to all the professionals that help to my, my country fellows in all, in all the world because many Venezuelans are are in maybe in, in those countries and the sphere to give us a, a, a like a tool to to participate and not only like a workers and also like a a, 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 a people that receive the help thank you okay. thank you thank you very much miguel um okay let's uh, move on now uh, to our final speaker um, and I would like to welcome Aya, Aya Yagan, um, who is a spear trainer and consultant uh, based in Turkey and she's going to be talking to us today about shelter response after the Turkey Syria earthquakes. So over to you Aya, thank you. Thank you very much Felicity and it's lovely to be here with everyone here and it's a great opportunity to join uh, this learning session. Um, a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Aya Yagan. I'm based in Turkey. I'm a sphere trainer and I'm a technical director at NSDation. At NSDation, we provide services such as monitoring and evaluation, research and capacity building. And today I will be sharing with you collective uh, observation and lessons learned from uh, multiple projects that we engaged in evaluating in Syria and Turkey after the earthquake. Um, and also I'll provide a, a quick overview uh, for, for those who doesn't know about the earthquake, uh, the scale and uh, like the number of people who, uh, who have been affected. I'll provide a little bit uh, of a background. So whatever is, is presented today, of course, does not represent any one <clears throat> sorry, humanitarian <clears throat> organization, but it's a collective learning that, as I said, is uh, pertained to multiple agencies implemented their emergency response after the earthquake of Syria and Turkey. So a little bit of the background, uh, last year on February 6, a 7.8 uh, uh, magnitude earthquake uh, uh, hit Turkey and Syria, particularly the southeastern part of Turkey and the northwest part of Syria. And that was followed by multiple strong aftershocks. And the earthquake was the largest in centuries in the region, of course. And it came in the winter season, of course, and it killed, unfortunately, more than 50,000 people in both countries. And it caused a massive distraction in infrastructure and basic services in both countries. So today I'll be focusing on three main learning. First is talking about like how um, organizations, uh, when they first started their emergency response, how they interacted with assessing the needs and what learning we're going to take from that. The second is what sort of shelter response was provided in both countries and how the shelter response was adap adapted. And the third is a little bit about safeguarding. Um, so to begin with, um, I will talk about uh, needs assessment. And I'm happy that uh, some of the prior panelists touched base on, on, on these impo the importance of these topics. Uh, so first of all, at the onset of the crisis, of course, because of the scale of the crisis, we all know that uh, Turkey is an urbanized uh, country and is a developed country with a robust system. However, the, the, the scale of the emergency was beyond the capacity of any government, even though in Turkey we have a, a national response uh, uh, agencies to respond to emergency cases, because we all know also is, Turkey is prone to earthquakes 
earthquake and it, it an earthquake prior happened in in Turkey however uh when 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 uh, the international uh, humanitarian agencies the the government and also the local agencies the volunteers when they started to respond both in Turkey and and in Syria, the first thing that they went for is needs assessment, of course. And unfortunately, everyone ran to conduct needs assessment. And we all know that needs assessment, we have multiple types of needs assessment. We have a rapid needs assessment. We have a detailed needs assessment. We have multi-sectorial needs assessment. So there are different forms of assessment that, would, that should be implemented at the onset of the crisis, after a certain period of the crisis. So at the beginning, majority were striving for detailed uh, uh, information. They wanted to understand the needs. Of course, the, the obvious need is shelter, but there are more than that. So these needs assessment, because of the scale and because Turkey uh, announced a, 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 a national emergency and a lot of humanitarian and foreign international organizations uh, stepped in, and of course the local uh, uh, actors stepped in, there were multiple hands and there were multiple also uh, uh, assessments were taking place. So that led actually that that wasn't well coordinated, especially at the onset of the crisis. And that led to a generalized assessment of needs rather than in-depth assessment of need. And that also caused assessment fatigue. So here we're talking about people coming out of shock. They lost friends, they lost family members, they are affected. And uh, on top of that, they are being multiple time asked by humanitarian agencies about their needs, about their needs. So that led to assessment fatigue to the affected population. These were some of our findings. And we found very little evidence about uh, humanitarian agencies going really in depth to understand what are the specific needs of specific groups, like the elderly, like uh, the people with disabilities, like the people who are located in, in the mountains, for example, or people who are in uh, hard to reach areas. Of course, we need to acknowledge here that the response was, was, was operating in a very challenging environment. Of course, we had a lot of destruction in the infrastructure. We had some cities were blocked. For example, I don't know if you have heard about Hatay, but Hatay, it was like in, in the borders. It's a border city with Syria, and it had almost, almost few entries to, to, to the city. So almost, almost all the entries were blocked. And people were also fleeing the city because of the devastating earthquake on the first few days. So it was very chaotic. People are getting out, trucks are getting out, car are, cars are getting out, and also people are getting in for help, for rescue efforts. So it was a very hectic situation at the beginning, of course. And um, within that situation, I'm just trying to explain the complexity from, from practical uh, uh, point of view. So that that lead uh, to to kind of like duplicated of efforts uh, in terms of like assessing the needs and inability to kind of like streamline what are the what are the the basic needs and what are the most pressing needs what are the hard to uh, the hard to reach areas what are the vulnerable groups needs so that was unclear at the beginning. Later on, a good example, of course, uh, uh, we know that the, in any emergency, in any emergency uh, situation, we have a chairing coordination bodies such as OCHA, for example, who are responsible to coordinate the humanitarian efforts. So OCHA have one of the systems that called the DEEP platform, which is the data entry and exploration platform. So OCHA activated that platform. Um, it was a little bit late, but it was activated after a couple of weeks. And that platform is actually uh, um, to share multi-sectorial needs assessment data reports with humanitarian responders. So it's an open platform. It is accessible for all humanitarian agencies and everyone who could lead on a needs assessment or who could have uh, their reports and their data, they can share it on the platform so everyone can have access to the same information. So that was a good example that we found, but it came a little bit late. So one of the kind of like we assessing multiple emergency response in the region, we are seeing that this is a recurrent lesson in emergency response that humanitarian actors, of course, need to be better prepared in needs assessment and in coordination. 
uh, for, for setting up and for uh, responding more efficiently. So that's on the first uh, uh, learning part. The second, uh, the second pillar I would like to present today is the shelter response. Um, of course, um, as I said, the obvious need after the earthquake in Syria and Turkey is shelter. But what sort of shelter response, what so sort of shelter assistance was provided to both communities? What are the resources in Turkey? What are the resources and barriers in Syria? So that's what I want to, to explain now. So um, the first um, the first intervention in, in Turkey was provision of tents and caravans. Um, of course, the, the shelter assistant at the beginning, and when I say at the beginning, I'm talking here about the first three months, was a little bit unorganized because of the many intervention. And of course, the government, government was trying to mobilize resources and to coordinate. But also just to, to, to acknowledge that even the, the government staff, even the, the, the humanitarian agency staff, majority of them who are located in the earthquake affected areas, they have their staff affected or their family affected. So we're talking about also an affected, uh, an affection in, in, in the human resources as well, not only in the infrastructure. So also, um, uh, so as I mentioned, in Turkey, the tents and caravans were provided at the beginning. In Syria, also tents were provided as well. I want to dig deeper a little bit to talk about the different groups in both countries. If, we, if we're going to talk about Turkey, if we're unrevealing the community fabrics, we know that the affected areas in, in, in Turkey has diverse groups. So here we're talking about a host community, which is a Turkish population, and we're talking about the refugee uh, community. We know that Turkey hosts a, a large uh, refugee group of the Syrian communities, as well as Afghan and Iraqi communities. We have large numbers of these refugees located in the earthquake affected areas. And of course, if we're going to talk about the host community, the Turkish community is also uh, diverse with different uh, ethnicity group, with different groups, with political affili affiliations. So we have diversity from both uh, communities. So understanding those diversity at the onset of the crisis for international humanitarian agencies was a little bit of challenge. And part of the evaluation findings that we that we undertook uh, across the refugees versus the, ho the host group, we have been hearing some unsatisfaction from both groups. So people were saying that for people who received tents, uh, they were unsatisfied because they're seeing other people who received caravans. And in their opinion, caravans are more uh, resistant to weather conditions, for example, especially here we're talking about winter. So they were the, we were seeing that these type of uh, sensitivities. Also, we have been hearing from people that some areas were prioritized or served first before some areas as well. So here we're talking about access barriers, also knowledge barriers, because the needs were not obvious to everyone, especially, of course, at, at, the, at the beginning. Uh, so, um, so the sensitivities emerged at the, fir at the first uh, six months, as I mentioned, and organization, <clears throat> sorry, and organizations started to understand the context better. And of course, this uh, uh, this here I would like to highlight, of course, the importance of uh, working with national responders. National responders were were kind of like uh, they 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 were deployed everywhere, and uh, we have been seeing like the small local organizations suddenly growing and uh, scaling up their efforts to respond and to collaborate with international agencies and also with government agencies to respond and to better understand the needs. Because also we are here to speak about different languages. In these regions, people speak Turkish, people speak Arabic, people speak Kurdish and Armenian and other languages as well. So we're talking about the consideration of, of uh, the language as well. <clears throat> In Syria, uh, the shelter response was a little bit different. Of course, I uh, we all know that we have a, a major gap in Syria, which is the absence of a governing authority in those areas. We're talking about northwest part of Syria, which is lack of a governing authority. So the shelter assistant was mainly led by the humanitarian actors, and mainly tents were provided uh, for Syria. But if we look at the situation in Syria, we already 
already know that we have a protracted crisis for Syria that has been going for more than a decade due to the uh, armed conflict in Syria. And still until now, after 10 years or 12 years of after the, 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 the conflict in Syria, there are, we still have camps uh, in the border areas with Turkey, these camps, we, we still have families sitting in tents for years and years. So when the earthquake hit, many of the families in Syria, they, they came to the to these camps. So we have like a, a crowded camps and we have camps suddenly extended and extended. And there is a pressure to accommodation, a pressure on, serv on, on, on uh, basic services as well. So when organization wanted to respond uh, uh, in Syria, first of all, they acknowledged that they need to go for a holistic approach. So the targeting, of course, for any camp were was targeting the whole camp, meaning that targeting the prior camp residents and also the new arrivals. Because you have to understand that if you target only the, the new arrivals, you're going to create sensitivity, you're going to cre create a lot of issues. So targeting was a kind of like holistic, understanding the needs of both, especially even if sometimes, because the shelter response was also a uh, accompanied with uh, hygiene kits and non-food items. So these considerations were for both, uh, uh, for both groups. <clears throat> And now, uh, now after uh, uh, after six months of of uh, of uh, the response, the shelter response in Syria also was taking another form of uh, uh, forming like a small cities. I will show you some photos now, so you can see that some organizations acknowledging and based on their experience working in the Syria context that an understanding that there is nothing more permanent than temporary people have been have been living in 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 uh, in intense and collective shelters for years acknowledging that and knowing that the conflict still didn't settle in Syria and many people do not have homes we have seen uh, uh, bi uh, we have seen uh, we have seen uh, uh, building mini cities and some organizations opted for establishing mini cities after the earthquake so it can host these mini sittings it's it has like two story buildings so it can host massive number of the people who have been affected also after the earthquake and these shelters when they were built they were built by uh, also the affected community themselves through the cash for work program so that was a very good approach that we identified through the evaluation that was appreciated uh, from the affected community being engaged in the response and taking more ownership in in uh, finding solutions for for their uh, for their um, for their needs. Um, and just to emphasize that this the shelter solution was adapted based on on the phase of the response as we can see based on the context the needs the season as well and the, as per the sphere recommendation before i move on to the third one allow me to share with you some photos so you can feel a sense of connection um one second we we have 10 minutes to go aya so we'll need you to Okay, I'll finish be... up soon, but we would love to see the photos, please. I know that some people would like to see some photos so they can. Um... One second. Yeah. So here, as you can see, this is at the onset of the crisis. This is uh, uh, setting tents uh, by Shelter Box, which is one of the organization. As you can see, this is a collective camp. These are tents also provided at the onset of the crisis by Afad. And this is also a, a protected city because after a after couple of months, the government of Turkey, uh, they started to organize all the the scattered uh, camps, all the scattered tents even in the country and because they need to be protected and they need to have access to, uh, to basic services. So Turkey started to organize all the camps in caravans so and in, in, in one area which is seized, protected and all the, uh, all the uh, basic services are provided. This is also another model of a shelter response that has been provided in Syria by concern. So in this photo, we can see two different, two different models. This is from the inside of the tent. 
And this is uh, of, uh, an example of a city that is built in Azaz area in Syria as a response for the earthquake. It's by Ihaha. This is another photo. And that's it. These are the different forms of uh, shelter response that we have seen in both countries. Now, quickly on the safeguarding, um, when we talk about the safeguarding for the emergency uh, system, uh, we acknowledge that after the earthquake in Syria and Turkey, the safeguarding system struggled to develop quickly enough. The situation, um, as any sudden emergency, of course, is complicated. And, uh, of course, people living in tents, container, they are exposed to, to protection risks, especially uh, people with uh, special needs, children, women, unaccompanied children, the, they are exposed to many protection risks. Of course, here also we're talking about uh, access barriers, abuse, uh, gender-based violence, and other risks. So some INGOs, especially those operating in Turkey without registrations, they 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 adapted their models of intervention. So they uh, collaborated and they forced partnership with national responders and local partners. Um, and in Turkey, we have a lot of uh, local partners, but they are not humanitarian actors. Most of them were pre-existed uh, community groups, associations, or development actors. So when INGOs started to partner with these uh, actors, <clears throat> they need to bring them up to speed with humanitarian standards and humanitarian hey. systems and humanitarian... Can we mute? So... Uh, so making so making efforts for capacity building on protection gender inclusion was a priority so most of the ingos in their second phase of the response they adapted their plan and they added uh, a specific resources that means uh, budgeting and that means capacity building plan to build the capacity of staff on humanitarian standards such as sphere such as the chs such as the humanitarian standards as well and safeguarding systems also, when we talk about the complaint and feedback mechanism, we identified that the feed complaint that feedback mechanism was also delayed to be established at the onset of the crisis. And we have seen when we're comparing between both countries, because Syria has been a protracted crisis for a long time, it has a very well and developed uh, complaint and feedback mechanism and people, communities in Syria were used to provide feedback and to receive information and to have two-way communication with international organization. That was kind of like a set system in Syria. When we come to Turkey, when even when organizations started to set up the complaint and feedback mechanism, we have seen that the, the system were less utilized. So people didn't have that culture of uh, providing feedback to the uh, unhumanitarian assistant or having that uh, open communication with the humanitarian agencies. Of course, that's that's something that could be expected, but uh, for emergency onset, uh, that would call for, of course, better preparedness and lighter community feedback and mechanism systems that can be scaled up after uh, after we have more uh, uh, more expansion and after we have uh, uh, a robust presence in the country. So just to conclude that uh, the thing that I want to highlight here is that preparedness, as my prior colleagues shared, is priority for, for us as humanitarian agencies, especially when we have increased natural disaster and armed conflict nowadays. So that's it from my side, Felicity, over to you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Aya, for that really um, detailed um, analysis of the situation that I think we all appreciated. Um, so thank you, Aya. Um, and I can see yeah, a little some thanking in the chat. Um, so um, we have six minutes. Um, so um, please, if you have any questions for Aya, um, put them in the chat. And I think all of our speakers are very happy uh, to be contacted. Um, for more information. So please don't hesitate if you have questions uh, for any of the speakers. Um, I would like to sum up, I guess, um, first of all, by thanking you all for attending this session, which I think has been really interesting. And for me, 
has really demonstrated the versatility of Sphere as a tool in that we've had examples um, from very different contexts, from Japan, Spain, Indonesia, Venezuela, Turkey, and Nepal, um, where the handbook has been used in different, different ways and different contexts. Um, and the second thing that I take from this, from this uh, webinar is the commitment of the Sphere community um, to quality and accountability. So I would really like to thank our speakers, um, Nahoko, Aya, Ida, Borja, Raju and Miguel um, for your time today. You, you've given your own time to prepare these presentations and to share your experiences. And we are really, really grateful. Um, for me, this has been a wonderful learning experience and I hope you've all enjoyed it. And thank you everyone for coming. And if anyone has any questions or comments, um, please do put them in the chat. Um, and we hope to see you next time. Um, please check out the HNPW um, website. Um, because we have two more online sessions next week. Um, there'll be one on keeping quality at the forefront of humanitarian assistance. Um, that's next Tuesday. And we have a really practical uh, workshop online um, on Wednesday morning, our time in Geneva, on integrating nature-based solutions. Nature-based solutions, so I have to say that slowly, um, into humanitarian response. So if you can, please join us online next week and stay in touch with Sphere. Um, it's wonderful for us all to, to keep on learning from each other. And thank you once again to our amazing speakers. Thank you.